Hey guys, I've got some stuff that I want to show you today, but first, let me get this out of the way. Hey guys! Alright, so up until this point, every one of my videos has just been my hands, but I wanted to be able to do more kinds of videos for you guys more frequently, so we're gonna change things up a little bit. Finally got some decent equipment for this kind of thing, and I spent the last few weeks basically redoing my whole workroom just for you guys. You wanna see it? I'm pretty excited about that part. And yeah, this should open things up a little bit and make it so that I can do more kinds of videos for you guys that I haven't really been able to do before. Like today's video. One of the questions that I get asked most frequently is what equipment do I use when I make stuff and what would I recommend for somebody getting into electronics or 3D printing? So I'm gonna divide this up into two videos. This one is gonna be about my soldering setup and tools and accessories that I recommend for anybody getting into electronics. And then the next one, hopefully in a week or two, will be about my 3D printers, things that I like and don't like about each one of them and that kind of stuff. And like it says in the title, Amanda over at Quadance has been really generous. She's given me two sets of their helping hands to give away to you guys. They make some of the nicest and most sturdy helping hands that I've ever used. So I'm really excited to give those away and a big thank you to them for that. So here in a few minutes, I'll show those to you guys and I'll tell you how you can win one. All right, now before I start, you can probably tell I don't sound very good. Right after I started making this video, I came down with a cold, but even though I sound terrible, I feel a lot better, so we're gonna keep going. Also, all the tools and accessories that I'm gonna show you today, there should be an Amazon link in the description. All right, so if you're just getting into electronics, then it won't be very long before you're gonna find yourself needing a soldering iron. I always see at least a couple people in the comments asking if there's any way to do the projects that I'm showing without soldering. And it's true that you can do a lot of cool stuff and some prototyping with breadboards, but you're gonna hit a wall pretty quickly if you ever wanna put that inside of a case and have a nice finished end product like a Game Boy Zero or something else. In fact, even the nicest, most plug-and-play all-in-one boards for the Game Boy Zero, like Kite's latest board, which, by the way, I'll have a video for that soon, so keep an eye out for that, they still require a little bit of soldering. So here are two features that you absolutely need to make sure that you get when you go to buy a soldering iron. The first is adjustable temperature. Depending on what kind of components you're working with, how fragile they are, and what type of solder you're using, you're gonna wanna be able to turn the temperature up and down in different situations. A lot of the really cheap ones don't have this, they'll just have a wattage specified on them and the soldering iron is just kind of stuck at the temperature that it heats up to. The other feature is interchangeable tips. The tip of your soldering iron is going to wear out eventually, either sooner or later depending on how well you take care of it and what you're doing with it. Additionally, just like with adjusting the temperature, it can be really nice to be able to change out the size and shape of your soldering iron tip depending on what you're working on. So you can go anywhere from a few dollars all the way up to a few hundred dollars on a soldering iron. I don't necessarily recommend going to either extreme. And there are several popular brands out there that tend to have both those features on most of their soldering irons. Two big ones are Hako and Weller. They tend to be a little bit on the pricier side, but they also tend to have a lot of nicer features that the cheaper ones don't have, like automatic shutoff and some other things like that. All right, so with all that said, this is the soldering station that I've been using for the last year and a half or so. I've been really happy with it, and I know that a few other people on the forums have been using it as well. It has the two features that I mentioned on it, and the tips are actually compatible with Hako brand tips, but it also has this hot air rework gun attached to it, which I didn't think that I'd use very much, but I use this thing all the time. It's especially handy for stripping down Raspberry Pis. So like removing the USB port, HDMI port, stuff like that, to make it smaller so that it can fit inside projects easier. You can get it for between $50 and $60, so not bad at all, and you get a lot of bang for your buck. Okay, so you might be wondering why I didn't put something like a multimeter at number two. But if you don't have something to hold whatever you're soldering while you're working on it, you're gonna have a bad time. So number two is a set of helping hands. And like everything else, you can go really cheap or kind of expensive. But in this case, if you're just getting into the hobby, you don't wanna spend a lot of money, there's not a lot of risk in going really cheap. In fact, this is a set that I used for a number of years. I used it in several of the first videos that I did. It's not very sturdy, it feels pretty cheap, but it is pretty cheap. And it'll actually get you pretty far if you're trying to save some money. A step up from that is these guys from Hobby Creek. I've been using these for about the last year or so, and it's a pretty big step up in terms of quality. They're much more flexible and easier to adjust 
I like the clips a lot better as well. They have these nice silicone tips on them that won't melt if you're soldering something right next to them. You can get it for like 18 bucks. It doesn't have a base on it, but it does have a really strong magnet. So for a couple of bucks, you can go to Walmart and get a two and a half pound weight and it sticks really well to it and it's nice and sturdy. So the whole setup is under 20 bucks. A pretty big step up from both of those is this set from Quad Hands. I showed this in one of my recent videos and it's really grown on me. I wasn't sure about it at first, but the more I used it, the more I appreciated how sturdy it is. It's got this really thick base. It's like a quarter of an inch thick. And then it's got these huge rubber feet on it. It's just ridiculous. The arms are nice and sturdy. In fact, even just to get them to rotate, you have to sort of unlock them, rotate them, and then lock them into place. So even if you're working with something heavy, it's gonna to stay exactly where you put it. It goes for about $45, but you really do get what you pay for. You can get some accessories for it as well, like the soldering iron tip cleaner, which has a magnet on the bottom of it that sticks to the base of the quad hinge. I like that. So like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, I have two sets of these to give away. So check out the description. There'll be a link to a blog post. You should be able to enter to win on there. I'll leave entries open until the end of the month. That's when I'm hoping to have my next video up. So if you watch this after that, sorry you missed it, but be sure and subscribe and hit that notification button because I'm going to be doing a lot more of these types of giveaways here in the future. This next one kind of goes along with the helping hand, so I'll go ahead and get it out of the way. And that is the surface that you're working on. Unless you're working on just like a really old beat up table that you don't care about at all, you're probably gonna wanna have some kind of mat underneath whatever you're working on. It might sound kind of obvious, but what to look for might not be so obvious. So I've tried several different materials and by far the best kind of mat that I have found to use is a silicone mat. There's a couple of reasons for that. For one, it's incredibly resistant to heat. So if you get your soldering iron tip too close to it, or a hot air gun, or even if you drip some molten solder on it, it's not gonna damage it and it's gonna protect the table underneath. The other reason is that virtually nothing will stick to this. I mean, pretty much you name it paint, glue, even molten solder, once it hardens or dries, you can pretty much just peel it right off. And then you can wipe it down with some alcohol and it looks brand new. A lot of them also have some pockets up at the top to hold screws for whatever you're working on. And some of those even have a magnetic strip behind them to hold the screws in place. So yeah, these kinds of mats are just awesome. All right, so sort of the last bigger item that I'd recommend getting right off the bat is a multimeter. Now, believe it or not, this is actually something that you can get away with using a cheaper one and it'll get you pretty far. In fact, I used a dirt cheap one for a number of years before upgrading recently. I'll tell you why I upgraded here in just a minute. But the things that you'll be using it for are measuring voltage, current, resistance, and checking continuity. And continuity is just a fancy way of saying checking that two points on a board or that two wires are directly connected. So you can use that to check and make sure that all of the solder joints that you created are nice and solid. And pretty much any of them will be able to do those things for you. But the two things that I would recommend looking for when you're getting one are beeping on continuity check, which means that the multimeter just beeps whenever you find continuity between two points. That was actually the whole reason that I upgraded recently, because you can check continuity by setting your multimeter to resistance and then checking between two points. And when you see the resistance drop to zero, you know that you found continuity. That's how I had been doing it for years and it works just fine, but it can be kind of annoying for some situations because you have to position the probes and then you have to keep an eye on the screen to watch the resistance value. It can just be kind of a pain to do. So that's definitely a feature that I'd look for. The other feature is automatic scaling of the voltage that's displayed on the screen. A lot of the cheaper ones will require that you actually turn the knob to different positions depending on what voltage range you're gonna measure. One like this one does that for you automatically, so it's just one less thing to worry about. Okay, so that's it for the really big things that I would recommend getting right off the bat if you're getting into electronics. Now we'll go through a few other smaller things that are still really nice to have on hand. So it's pretty much a guarantee that at some point, you're gonna need to remove solder from whatever you're working on. Whether it be because you accidentally connected two things that you shouldn't have, maybe you dripped some solder onto it while you were working on something, or maybe you're removing components and you just wanna remove the excess solder that's left over. Whatever the reason is, it's gonna happen, and that's where these come in. This is a solder sucker, and you may have seen me use it in some previous videos. The way that it works is you heat up the solder that you're trying to remove, you push the plunger in, put the tip next to the solder, and push the button. Pretty simple. It's especially nice for uneven surfaces, like maybe a board with a lot of components on it and you just need to remove a blob of solder from somewhere. This is really good for that. Now if you're trying to completely remove all the excess solder from a surface, this will get you about 80% of the way there. To get it completely clean, that's where this comes in. This is a desoldering braid, and again, you may have seen me use it in a previous video. It's basically just a stranded braid of copper wire. So you can press this up against whatever solder you're trying to remove, heat it up, 
and it will wick that solder up into itself. This is nice for removing virtually all of the excess solder from a surface. In fact, in the VMU build that I did recently, if you look carefully, you can see that I dripped some solder onto some of the button contacts. This is what I used to remove that solder and make it a nice smooth surface so you can't tell that it ever happened when you're pushing the buttons. So next, a couple of things to help you take care of the tip of your soldering iron. As you're using it, you'll need to clean the tip of your soldering iron periodically as it accumulates some excess solder, maybe some burnt flux and things like that. So the best thing for doing that is one of these that I showed earlier. These are nice because you just kind of stick the tip in there and wiggle it around and it cleans all that off for you. Nice and simple. Some people just use a wet sponge which does the job, but the problem with that is that it will cool down the tip of your soldering iron and it'll have to reheat a little bit after you clean it off every time. It's not a huge deal, but I've also heard some people say that that can decrease the life of your tip because it's constantly heating up, cooling down, and going through that cycle while you're using it. I don't know how true that is, but these things work way better anyway. And then another thing to take care of it is tinning the tip of your soldering iron. That basically just means putting a very thin layer of solder across the whole tip. So that can make it a lot easier to work with it, but it can also make it last a lot longer if you remember to do that every time that you're done using it. You don't need anything special to do this per se. There are a lot of good videos out there for how to do that. But if you're lazy like I am, this stuff is fantastic. Just like with this, you just kind of stick it in there and it'll tin it for you nice and easy. And then the last one might kind of surprise you because it might have sounded like I was putting it down a little bit earlier, but one thing that's really handy to have on hand is a breadboard. It's basically just a grid of connected columns and rows of pinholes. So if you're prototyping something, if you're trying to figure out how something is going to be arranged, you can do it on a breadboard first before you make it permanent with solder. This is also one of the best ways to just start tinkering around with Arduino and Raspberry Pi and making them interact with things like buttons and LEDs. So really handy to have a couple of these on hand. All right guys, well I think that about does it. Like I said, this video is more geared towards people just getting into this hobby. So if that's you, then I hope this helps you get started. And if that's not you, then thanks for watching anyway. I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comments. Is there anything that I missed? Are there tools and accessories that you definitely recommend people get right off the bat? Also let me know if there are any videos or tutorials or projects that you'd like to see me tackle. Be sure to visit the link in the description where you can enter to win a set of quad hands. And again, a big thank you to them for making that happen. Next time I'll be telling you guys about my 3D printers and giving you guys some tips and things that you can look for when you're going to buy one. I've also got a bunch of projects lined up including a build with Kite's latest board, so stay tuned for that and I'll see you next time.